Well, hello, this is Gary Seal, True Kind Sales Consulting. The subject of this presentation is small to medium sized business enterprises, very common sales concerns. These are some of the things that I've seen over the past 12 years. I thought you might appreciate hearing about some of those and possibly ways to correct them, but they are things that literally put a glass ceiling over our head and stop us from moving forward. So let's take a look at sales concern number one. And let me mention that these are not necessarily in order of importance, but just simply they are one of 20 that I have determined are issues in the marketplace. Now, concern number one, no clearly defined target market. If you as a sales manager have people and this is only in your head and you haven't communicated it to your sales associates, then shame on you, they're wasting a lot of time. If you are a solo contributor and you haven't taken time to clearly know who your best prospects are, then what I would tell you is that quite frankly, you're wasting time and money by going after people who are not ever going to be real prospects or customers for you. Especially, this is important when you're new in business, you have to narrow down and focus, develop a reputation in the marketplace that says you have expertise before you can move on to different fields or different areas. So by all means, get out there, ask a lot of questions, read a lot of papers, talk to people, find out where they're doing well and how you might fit into the marketplace. Very important. All right, concern number two, something that as salespeople we tend to take for granted because a lot of high I, high D included into sales. And in fact, that's an issue. We should not be going around dour and uh, you know, sourpuss, negative, that sort of thing. We owe it to ourselves and our customers to be positive, confident, energetic, and by all means, we cannot be scarcity oriented. We can't be so concerned that there will never be another prospect that we get commission breath and get all over these people. That's why you have to have a lot of people in the top of your sales funnel. And then by all means, a challenge for me, quite frankly, is smile when you're saying that. Show that you're positive, show that you're confident, that sort of thing. Concern number three, no differentiation message developed and used. There's so much competition in the marketplace and you need to be able to stand out. You need to have that confidence we talked about on the previous slide to be able to get in front of your customer and tell them why they should do business with you instead of your competitors. Now, I would tell you one of the ways to do this is to have a well-developed tagline. And by that, I mean a seven to 10 word statement that tells your customers who you are, what you do, and why they should buy from you. Sally Hogshead in her landmark marketing book says that we have seven seconds to impress somebody. So think about that next time you announce yourself in a group, introduce yourself, and somebody says, what do you do? Don't launch into a five minute monologue, but look at them and say something like, I deliver the art and science of sales with excellence. That's nine words said in about four or five seconds it conveys what I'm attempting to do in the marketplace. You should have something similar that you stand out in your prospect's mind. All right, question or concern number four. Your product offering is too diffuse for your capacity and consequently you're not trustworthy. I'm probably not speaking to very large companies with a number of departments. They have the size to hire a great deal of expertise. 
a number of us came from Fortune 500 companies where we were surrounded by different departments and levels of expertise. We got some exposure. And so when we got out here on our own, we assumed we could do all these things when in fact we should have stuck to what we did best, what we knew best, and not promoted the fact that we're everything to everybody. So if you have too much on your website, you're advertising things that you really don't have a depth of knowledge about, retract just a little bit until you can hire that expertise or develop that expertise and be extremely confident that you can deliver it. Do not get yourself spread too thin. It's a aspect of failure by assuming that you can do all those things. All right, this is something that I never really think of myself as being too aggressive, but if uh, I can be accused of anything, it's possibly following up too frequently or perhaps even being too optimistic that I can close business when I know there's a lot of competition out there. So what characterizes somebody that we assume are, is too aggressive? They have pressure closes. They're in their prospect's face. They tend to be arrogant and assume that they do know it all. They make unbelievable claims, which is another way, a polite way of saying there's lying in the marketplace. They have predatory marketing type techniques, which means they're making claims above and beyond or they're making bait and switch type claims. Do not allow yourself to fall into this type of category because you burn bridges and you burn bridges for a long time that's going to hurt you. Don't be too aggressive. Bottom line right there. Point number six, and one of the big ones that I see, and certainly I've fall, fallen victim to this myself, is that when the owner is tasked to perform the sales and marketing role, in addition to all the other owner manager responsibilities, you're out there trying to set up your books, pay your taxes, stay in line with federal and state regulations. You're trying to build infrastructure for your company. You're developing new products and you're allowing vendors to call on you. You're learning new software. All those things that consume a lot of time and then you get sucked up in the operations or perhaps you're per, uh, more of a business inventor, a product uh, manufacturer and sales and marketing is not a distinct skill set for you. However, that's your task. And so what happens, it gets put off and put off till the end of the day, the end of the week. And you look up, you're tired, you're exhausted, you can't face another no in the marketplace. And consequently, it does not happen. What I would tell you here is, especially if you're new, you need to carve out a substantial amount of your time for sales and marketing. I would tell you if you're new, you need to think about 60% of your time in this particular arena. Or take Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, read it and then understand you've got the block out time to go and prospect, network, shake hands, have meetings, let people know what you do, wave your flag, create a brand, and then you'll be able to work on your operational things. But by all means, carve out distinct times where you will not be interrupted. That's the answer to the question. It's not an easy answer, but it is the answer. You cannot ignore it. Number seven, especially if you're small, you say, I don't need a vision statement. I know it all. I'm right here. It's my company. It's me and perhaps a part-time associates. Let me assure you for your own sake, as well as your associates, it's a great idea to have a vision statement. Where do you plan your company to be in one year, three years, five years? What market share do you want to gain? What culture do you want to institute? What infrastructure do you want to have that's going to allow you to prosper? 
all of those things should be written down in a short paragraph that allows all of your business associates, your suppliers, your employees, yourself, anybody else that comes into contact with you, that you know where you're going. Now, in conjunction with that, you need to have a mission statement. Well, how does that differentiate from a vision? A mission, mission statement is literally what guides you in your day-to-day -day operations. A great example is one of the local police departments. They typically will have something on the side of their cars like to serve and to protect. Those two items are what their primary functions are. And if they're outside that bell curve, then they're not operating in their mission. So I'd ask you to ask yourself each and every time you look at an activity that you're involved in, does it involve some aspect of your mission statement that's contributing to your vision? If it's not, you need to cut it out of your schedule. That sounds cold and hard. There's something you may really enjoy, but you can't afford it until you hit your first million. You've got some money in the bank and you can hire some of these other things done. Stay on mission. Here's point number nine. This should be fairly self-evident in these days and times. There was a time 20, 25 years ago when the whole desktop laptop world was brand new before a lot of these apps and Facebook and LinkedIn became huge and popular. And nobody really knew what to do with it except maybe write letters, communicate on email, before it became a great marketing tool. I would tell you as a business to business person, it's a great idea to have your LinkedIn profile built out and be active in LinkedIn. That means posting groups and then in conjunction with that, get an email system and make sure you're dripping out letters to your people to let them know what you're involved in, what your capabilities are and how you can serve them. This also spills over into your website. You need to have great content. That's part of your digital marketing effort. We'll talk just a little bit more about that in a later slide. Be active. It's relatively inexpensive unless you start buying leads or paying for ads. And in that particular case, I would highly encourage you to get some professional advice before you start paying for ads. That can be a uh, bottomless hole where the money goes down there and you do not see any return. Be careful there. Point number 10 just seems oh so counterintuitive that you work really hard to get a prospect at the top of your sales funnel and then you don't follow up while your competitors are. Is it a fear factor? Or are you afraid you're going to lose the order because you call these people too many times? Well, let me tell you that the common number of times to get somebody's attention, to get them engaged with you, is now up around 10 to 12 times of contact before you really can't engage with somebody. So don't assume there's so many things. We just came out of the summer season. Now it's September and people are beginning to get more serious again. August was a squeeze in the last vacations before the kids went to school, before we knew this whole business drive that lasts from September to Thanksgiving is going on. Don't assume anything. And if you do irritate them, quite frankly, you caught them at the wrong time or they're not really a prospect. Don't give up. Just set a sequence a little bit more frequent at the, at the first part of the sales process and let it extend a little so that that prospect knows you're interested in their business. It works. And you'll, you can talk to any number of salespeople that will tell you they won due to persistence. Don't let the fear kick you in the can and not allow you to close business. Number 11, let's talk about what's going on in the marketplace for just a moment here. 
there are people who are shopping for your category of products who literally are shoppers now. There's so much information available on the web, on other people's websites, on your website, and they're going to be looking at that, reading it, and before they ever contact a person for a sales engagement, they practically become a subject matter expert themselves. If you don't have more information, in-depth information about your product, its capabilities, the industry, how things are gonna play out over the long term, then there's a strong probability that you will not get the order. You simply have to be on the cutting edge and be aware of what's going on. Now, I would also tell you it's a wise idea to have a very smooth presentation going and know when to ask for the order. Not session one, unless somebody's ear beaver to go and you've answered all their questions. But at the time you've gained their trust, don't let time go past that where you ask them if they're ready to issue you a purchase order or give you the go ahead to start delivery of your products. Close, by all means close at some time or the other, just not prematurely and be a subject matter expert by all means in your area. Now, number 12, I'd mentioned this in one of the previous slides, but your website has to be strong with content and the structure has to be set up so it's easy to navigate. And when someone goes on your website, they clearly know what you deliver, who to contact, how to contact you, and the other aspect of that, and I would assume you'd have to get some outside help here, is the search engine optimization aspect of your website. It needs to be constantly updated and people need to be able to find you. Be sure your organic search is the best you can afford in your particular area, but don't let that, con uh, that website content be a loser for you. Be on top of that by all means. It's relatively easy to update and be objective about what somebody sees when they pull up your website. Concern number 13, I think this falls into two different categories. If you're a relatively small company and you have a lot of control over what you're delivering, then you can go to your engineering staff or perhaps you individually or your software engineers or even you yourself as a person who delivers products, i.e. Uh, training, education, advice, that sort of thing. Make sure you're up to speed. Now, it's a entirely different situation when you're in a very large company. From the standpoint that you're out in the street actually talking to customers and you begin to get feedback, you need to make sure this flows back through your managerial staff, your marketing people, product development, uh, quality engineers, things of that nature, so that your product is at least competitive, if not superior to your other people's. If you're not practicing excellence in the marketplace, then it's going to cost you. Question concern number 14. This is something that's very epidemic with new people is they're so nervous about knowing it, making a sale. The comfort factor with being in sales is that they're not interacting with the true decision maker. They'll present to anybody, secretary, staff, people, somebody in front of the office, that sort of thing. You simply owe it to yourself to get in front of the people who can sign a check for you. Now, if you're calling and working into large corporations, one of the things I would recommend is that start at the very top or as top as you can go. You know, use LinkedIn, go to their uh, website, look up their financial 10K reports, find somebody in the upper echelon that you can contact that will possibly refer you down to the level where you can operate and present your product. So a top-down sell is a great way to do this, or just quite frankly, you have to be a little bit hard-nosed 
and tell the gatekeepers that you need to speak to the person who's really going to make the decision. Just be firm, be polite, and be persistent in this particular area. Number 15, this probably relates more to a company who does have a separate marketing plan or staff. However, if the marketing people are working on a particular category and that's the collateral that they're providing for you and you're out there trying to sell another area, it's just going to make it rougher on yourself. Or perhaps that there's a launch by the sales team into a particular area and the marketing folks are not aware of that or they're not supporting you with the type of sales material collateral, collateral presentations and things of that nature, then that's an issue. Make, make sure that you're working with your marketing people and senior management should be responsible for this sort of thing. If you're a, once again, a solo contributor, this should not be an issue but don't allow yourself to put marketing collateral as a third level criteria and not have information to support your efforts in the field. That's important. So be coordinated in that particular arena. Okay, here's one that uh, works specifically for a sales manager who has people reporting to him. Even though they may be experienced people, we know that we can only and expect what we inspect. So there has to be some accountability, whether it be call reports or some personal meeting, a phone call, something through a CRM. Your salespeople need to know that their actions are being monitored. And depending upon their level of experience, it may be fairly tight or somewhat loose, but never let it be totally non-monitored. There has to be accountability. There's just an aspect of human nature there that says I'm expected to get something accomplished or move forward with this account and there's no responsibility, no accountability. You can almost be guaranteed that that's going to slide over a period of time. Make your folks accountable. Okay, so here's one of the things that's happening in today's marketplace. There are so many ways that our sales efforts can be monitored by metrics. Uh, the amount of phone time that you're using, uh, the number of calls that you make, the number of presentation follow-ups that you do, and any other aspect of things that have been deemed important in the past become so weighty to the salesperson that it's costing them time from real selling efforts. I had someone tell me recently that they're spending at least one day a week filling out forms, reports, and making sure they hit their metrics, not because it was productive, but because he was concerned that if he didn't do it, he would lose his job. That's a horrible waste of time. Don't let your sales metrics interfere with the true selling effort from your sales team. Concern number 18, the comp plan penalizes instead of rewards sales contributors. Comp plans are one of the sticky issues in the sales world from the standpoint, you have to make it equitable for both the manufacturer employer and also the individual salesperson and that can be very difficult. Typically what happens if there's some sort of a base a quota system and a commission, if the person does extremely well, then the next year they will build a quota on top of that, where in fact there may have been some capital equipment orders that are not going to be repeated the following year. And the sales rep, even though they did well, is penalized because he makes less money by contributing. He was already going to make less money because the commission dollars were, weren't there. There are other times when people just really blow quota out and they make a huge amount of money, but before that check gets written, aha, quota goes up and they make less money than they were promised. So you can see when you start looking at these things, 
You can either starve your sales reps, because I have been on 100% commission plans before, that can be extremely tough because it's rarely consistent. Uh, when it's actually consistent, I'm talking about the income flow. And if you don't handle that well or you're not experienced, you'll quickly leave the particular company that you're employed with. So be careful in this arena and make sure you treat both parties equitably. Be sure you explain to your sales rep how the comp plan works and why it may change periodically. Number 19, no sales training or motivational methods. Training in and of itself is a motivational aspect of things. So by all means, even though you've got experienced people, teach them the five points of sales. If you have new people, make sure they're thoroughly indoctrinated into the way you want them to go out into the marketplace. Now, besides training, the whole motivation thing can be misunderstood. It doesn't mean that you're paying for luxury cruises to Hawaii or the Caribbean, or you're providing Super Bowl tickets or a big, huge cash bonus at the end of the year. Typically, people want empowerment. They want authority commensurate with their job responsibilities. And if you can incrementally provide that for them, then they're going to be fairly pleased with their job. However, if there's absolutely no training, no product training, no motivation out there, things get flat and motivation starts to wane. So don't allow that to happen to you. You can do these things relatively inexpensively. Now, number 20, no CRM in place. Just hard to believe in this day and time, there's no customer research management tool in place out there to track clients and prospects and sales opportunities. These things are typically available in the cloud, so you don't have to have a special appointment with your sales manager, or your inside customer service specialist, or perhaps even operations or other operational management people. They know what's going on and it's a great way to have accountability, a resource tool, a Rolodex electronically in the cloud, and it's portable. You simply have to do this. Now you can spend zero dollars or thousands of dollars. I would highly encourage you to go out there and do a lot of research before you get one going in the marketplace. But by all means, use it use it thoroughly and rely on it. It's really part of what's going on in your overall sales effort. Let me make you an offer. If you're wrapping up this presentation with me, you'd like to have a 20 question score sheet that allow you to score yourself out zero to 100 points. Just get in touch with me. Here's my contact information. GDS at TrueConBD.com is the best way. Just email me and ask me for sales card score sheet. I'll be glad to email that to you. If you have any questions regarding sales, don't hesitate to give me a call. Our first consultation is free, and I would uh, love to visit with you and find out about what's going on in your company and see if I can provide some help. Thanks for taking time to listen to this. Wishing you the best in your sales world.